professor of biomedical engineering at Yale University. So he received his BS in China, and then he did his PhD at uh, UC Berkeley, and then completed his postdoctoral training at Caltech. Uh, prior, to, prior to joining faculty of Department of Biomedical Engineering at Yale University in 2010. And his latest contributions to science and engineering include the development of single cell functional omics technologies and microengineered tissue models to interrogate cellular heterogeneity, activation states, and dynamics implicated in human health and disease. And uh, Dr. Fan also co founded Isoplexus and Singuron biotechnologies, and he's the recipient of numerous awards, including NCI Howard Temen Career Transition Award, the NSF Career Award, the Packard Fellowship for Science and Engineering. And he's a fellow of American Institute for Medical and Bio Biological Engineering, and elected as a uh, senior member of the National Academy of Inventors. And with this, I think Dr. Van will, start, will soon start presenting his, his talk. Uh, thank you, Emmett, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, uh, also, why I'm busy with uh, admitting all people in the waiting room to the uh, to the meeting room, uh, I will uh, go ahead and start the seminar. And so today, uh, I'm gonna continue the overview about the spatial omics uh, by following the wonderful uh, talk last week by Professor Koskan about the imaging based spatial omics, I'm gonna switch the gear a little bit to talk to you about the next generation high throughput sequencing based spatial omics technologies. All right, uh, so, so this is my disclaimer. And so what I'm gonna uh, heavily discussed today is uh, really how to create the map of the cells and really understand the tissue architecture. And uh, uh, nowadays you often hear this word called atlas. And I Google a little bit what atlas uh, actually means. It actually was the name of someone, a giant. Okay, in Greek myth, uh, atlas uh, was a giant. Uh, he was uh, kind of forced to hold the sky um, and a uh, uh, sort of later in 16th century, uh, the map maker, uh, Mercado, published a collection of books and uh, on the cover of that collection of books, they put a, the word there, atlas. So that's the very beginning, how come the atlas came to the, uh, uh, sort of the front cover of the, of, the book, of the map books. So now you're getting a key message. So atlas means two things. It has to have, it has to contain maps, number one. Number two, it's a collection of maps, not just the one. Uh, so in recent years, you heard about the Human Cell Atlas Project. And so the mission here is to create a comprehensive reference. Okay, apologize, I need to go to the waiting room to admit the people in. Okay, the mission here is to create a comprehensive reference maps of all human cells and the as the foundational units of life and as a basis for both understanding of human health and the development and the potential for the diagnosis and monitoring and a better treatment of human diseases. All right. So when you look at the omics at the different levels, okay, the bulk and the in recent years, the breakthrough allowed us to look at the omics at a single cell level. And in recent years, we further believe we need to look at this with high spatial precision, high spatial resolution as well. And what does that mean? Okay, for different types of measurements. If you look at the map of United States of America, okay, if that's a bulk measurement, you'll probably see the the shape of the map, you, know, you, you can guess that's USA. And single cell analysis basically is in the list of all different states, maybe many different cities as well, so of the subtypes of the cells, but you don't know where they are. Okay, only if you have 
the names are on the states on the map of the United States of America, you, you really get a map of our country. Okay, that's what we hope to, to get. That's what we hope to get out of our biological tissue organ system as well. All right, so uh, when I was working on this presentation slides yesterday, a wonderful perspective article came out yesterday in Cell and written by Professor Aviv Regev and many others in this construction called a, a, a tumor cell, okay, tumor cell atlas uh, network funded by National Cancer of Institute. And so here you can look at what measurements they are collecting, uh, they are conducting, and what types of data they are collecting uh, in this network. And from single cell bulk, and a spatial, for the first time, they realized they have to include a spatial, okay, as compared to similar omics project launched by National Cancer, of, National Cancer Institute many years ago, for example, the TCGA and the ICGC, they really focus on the omics and the bulk, and originally they were able to do single cells, but in this program, a heavy emphasis is on the spatial information as well. And the sister programs launched by National Institute of Health include this hub map, and also uh, this human disease atlas funded by different uh, institutes, they all emphasize the importance of the spatial information for us to understand the atlas associated with different human organs in both health and the disease. Uh, outside National Cancer, the federal agency, I think Human Cell Atlas Project I mentioned, and heavily uh, supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and also the Sanger Institute and the Broad Institute together. This is really team science happening now across the country and uh, around the globe to collect, uh, to collect the, uh, the spatial atlas information and ideally and a cellular resolution. Okay, now you see that is the goal of this kind of global team science research. And what tools have been used by the uh, Tumor Cell Atlas Project of the Ca National Cancer Institute? Okay, as you can hear, this is a summary of different molecular tools and what spatial molecular information you, you can get using those tools. And a nice summary here, okay, by Professor Avery Gives, you can broader categorize those tools into two major different subsets. So why is basically image-based? That's what Professor Koskan talked about last week. And the second is sequencing-based. That's what I'm gonna discuss, what I'm gonna focus on today. And so give you a little bit more granular information based on my own opinion. Okay, first of all, I will say this is my own opinion and also not a complete a comprehensive diagram uh, to, to delineate the landscape of the technologies and the tool in the spatial omic space. Uh, I would like to, again, categorize them into two major subsets. So why is image-based and the other NGS-based for omics level? Uh, however, for decades, I think people have been looking at the spatial information either by just looking at the image data or you can pick up the region of interest using laser micro dissection that's ha that has been around for, for many, many years. And turns out you can also use laser micro dissection followed by next generation sequencing to get a spatial omics information with, uh, uh, with reasonably good resolution, but not at a cellular level. Uh, also, it is not feasible, okay, to map down the entire tissue map across very large area using those region of interest techniques. And another region of interest the technology is called nanostrain geomix uh, DSP system, and uh, I will talk about that in one of the next slides as well. Uh, but for the image-based spatial omics technologies, and uh, you can image proteins, 
the expression of the genes using the fish technology. However, for many years, I think about 10 years ago, when I started my career at Yale, literally no one believed it is possible to image uh, like, a, uh, like a dozen or dozens of protein markers or uh, the messenger eyes. But now what we can do is really about the genome scale. It's this very fast paced space and a major leap occur almost every year. Uh, when you look at image-based, uh, you can look at the proteins and the same technology can be tweaked to look at the RNA messenger eyes as well, including the imaging cytometry and including the codex technology. I will talk a little bit at the very end of the talk today. And for MRI-based, uh, imaging-based technology to look at the uh, uh, spatial omics, largely they are all based on one fundamental principle called a fish, okay, fluorescent individual hybridization technology. So there are different uh, multiplex of fish. You can do single molecule fish with different uh, colors. Uh, you, the ACD uh, uh, biosciences has the technology called RNA scope, and uh, later, so Professor Long had a Caltech develop the sequential fish. Uh, they allow you to look at a panel of markers, either proteins or messenger eyes, uh, but not really in the omics level, not really in the genome scale. And so in the sick fish and the mer fish, these two technologies are the fish-based, uh, imaging-based fish technologies to, uh, to do omics, spatial, uh, omics level spatial profiling. Uh, so what I'm gonna focus on today is really NGS-based. And uh, for NGS-based technologies, if you want to have uh, the messenger is capture release, that's really the state of NAR right now. You, uh, you can use either the technology published in 2016 science called spatial transcriptomics, or the technology platform fully commercialized by Tank Genomics called Vision uh, to give you a relatively low spatial resolution, but still a pretty powerful spatial mapping and a genome scale. And the recent breakthrough uh, that occurred last year is the much higher resolution spatial uh, NGS based the spatial omics uh, profiling using SlideSeq or HDST. Uh, so I'm gonna also talk a little bit about what we develop in our own lab called DBASIC, which can give you a high spatial resolution, but also it can simultaneously profile proteins and the messenger eyes. This approach is fundamentally different from the, uh, the ST technology and the slice te technology uh, in that it doesn't require the capture of the messenger eyes. It turns out it's the fundamental principle is more or less like in a fish. You do in situ probing, but you don't do imaging. Instead, you sequence down using NGS to give you genome-wide information. Okay, this is a busy slide, uh, but I hope it give you a reasonable, clear uh, 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 description of the landscape of the tools available for spatial omics. Uh, so I talk about the fish. I think that was a wonderful presentation by Professor Koskan last week, and different technologies, different names there, but they are more or less based on the same fundamental principle, fish. So this call it like a fish enterprise, and as Professor Koskan also alluded, that's actually pretty technically demanding. Uh, you have to know how to do advanced microscopy uh, and uh, oftentimes the single molecule imaging. And, and also uh, you have to design the probe and uh, eventually that adds significant cost to your assay. And uh, uh, until nowadays, this technology is largely limited to the transcriptomics. And uh, it is not yet so clear, okay, how to extend the fish or fish-like techniques to other omics. And so, okay, so the focus today is to look at the NGS-based technology to reconstruct the spatial omics map. And so the first, Two slides 
uh, I'm going to talk about is, okay, if you don't have to map out pixel by pixel, you're just, you're just interested in the specific location and the technology uh, being around for decades called the laser micro dissection or laser captured micro dissection allows you to pick up specific region of the tissue, physically remove from the tissue slide and the transfer to the PCR tube, you can generate the low input uh, spatial defined low input sample transcriptomic sequencing data. So this is a paper published last year to show you how you can use this laser micro dissection to uh, map down the spatial uh, transcriptome spatial gene expression in the early embryo uh, uh, from uh, sort of e, E5.5 to the E7.5, just the uh, uh, early days of the uh, uh, sort of post uh, in the post implantation. So uh, another technology uh, for a commercialized by nano strain called a GeoMix. Uh, that's also the region of interest technology. So ROI feature specific detection. You can see. Uh, here, and this is immunochemical staining uh, tissue slide, but you can look at the image and, uh, and find down the specific region of interest, one, two, three, four, five, and up to uh, uh, dozens of those. You can pick by individual and transfer to the micro well, titer play, and perform conventional um, uh, reverse transcription and amplification. And, but this approach doesn't require physical resection of the tissue, instead they use photocleavable probes that cap that uh, immobilized on the surface to uh, recognize specific um, messenger uh, to recognize the messenger eyes. But you can uh, photocleave and release uh, the the probes. Uh, in this case, you can also look at the proteins as well, and you can afterwards amplify and get a omics spatial omics profiling data. All right, uh, so about three to four years ago, uh, a fundamentally different technology was published uh, by a group in Sweden. Uh, it is called a, a spatial transcriptomics using DA microarray based messenger capture. And this is a schematic uh, a de depiction of how this technology works. Uh, you have the, the tissue section uh, the frozen tissue section you prepare and put on the surface of the glass slide, but the glass slide has many DNA microarray spots, and each DNA microarray spot has unique uh, uh, the barcode probe, okay, called a spatial barcode uh, over here, but you also have oligo uh, DT to capture on a, 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 a so sort of poly A uh, micro eyes, uh, uh, messenger eyes, and afterwards you can do uh, reverse transcription and to generate a CDNA, but each CDNA has the, the spatial barcode incorporated and then you pull them together and amplify and a sequence. Now you can use the spatial code, spatial barcode to reconstruct the spatial uh, gene expression. Uh, so in this uh, technology, what you can achieve is about like a 100 micron spot size and 100 uh, 50 micron in spacing, you're not really looking at a cellular level, but it still, it can give you uh, a pretty informative spatial uh, location information. And also this is uh, not just a region of interest, this is the first technology that can give you a uh, very high throughput spatial uh, mapping, uh, although the resolution isn't uh, that impressive. So the same technology later was applied to the start of the human embryonic uh, heart tissues and uh, this, uh, the hearts uh, from the, the uh, 4.5 days and about seven, five and nine, uh, nine days, this PCW about uh, one month, uh, this one and a half month, about two months and uh, the different human fetal hearts. And you can make a uh, frozen section, cryo section of frozen, tissue slides and uh, perform the spatial transcriptomic analysis. And uh, in this study, the spot size are also about 100 micron. And, but the beautiful 
data also generated in this work includes the single cell transcriptome of the, the heart cells and also the in situ sequencing using uh, um, sort of in situ hybridization followed by uh, the base by base sequencing. So all three different data sets combine and use computational pipeline to integrate them together, you can really map down the different cell types, for example, from single cell sequencing to the spatial location by uh, sort of cross, uh, re uh, cross reference of your data between the spatial transcriptome and single cell transcriptomics sequencing data. So this uh, technology was uh, acquired by the Tenx Genomics, uh, uh, a well-known company in the space of single cell transcriptomics and uh, further develop this technology and uh, further improve. And now the spatial resolution can be further uh, reduced. The pixel size can be reduced to about 55 micron and they also increase the capture efficiency and a very uh, uh, robust, reliable tissue optimiz optimization protocol developed. And, but the fundamental principle is the same. Uh, you have the DNA microarray spot on the surface of, uh, of the glass slide and, a, and, a, and the different DNA spots have different molecular, molecular spatial molecular probes, uh, spatial molecular barcodes, and the probes can capture messenger eyes. And when you're generating a CDNA, you incorporate the spatial barcodes to different uh, CDNAs uh, depending on where the CDAs were captured uh, with, uh, with, the speci with specific uh, tissue uh, spatial location. Uh, so recently, uh, this paper uh, in, still in our archive about just a month ago and the beautiful work done by Andrew Jeffy's lab uh, from Johns Hopkins. Uh, they use this uh, Visium technology to map down in the, in the human uh, brain tissue in the uh, frontal cortex, uh, prefrontal cortex, and uh, this is six layers. Uh, when you uh, only use unsupervised uh, data analysis, clustering and the data analysis, you, you can actually see this layer structure, although uh, the, the clusters do not conform to the anticipate uh, six layer structure uh, very well. If you use the specific markers, you can uh, see the different layers, uh, but uh, you see quite noisy data. So now if you use uh, semi-supervised or supervised data analysis, uh, this allows you um, to identify very clear uh, six different layers in the frontal cortex of the human dorsal lateral uh, brain region. So just to quickly summarize the technology uh, I talk about here. Uh, using the DNA microarray based spatial transcriptome sequencing. Uh, uh, as of today, I think the technology either uh, in uh, Professor uh, so Landenberg's lab in Sweden or commercialized by Tenx Genomics have received a low resolution, not really at a cellular level, uh, about the cellular, about the cell clusters, uh, around uh, 25 to 100 cells per feature per spa, and the spa size typical 100 micron, uh, and a visum further improved improve it to 55 micron. And it is pretty good genome-wide profiling. Okay, and the sequencing data uh, allows you to uh, detect more than 20,000 20, genes and almost covering the entire human uh, transcriptome. And the sequencing Data quality also very good. The, the per spa, the number of unique transcripts you can detect, and number of unique genes you can detect are uh, like thousands or even ten thousand of UMIs you can detect. And the mappable area also very large compared to the face-based technology. This does give you unique uh, benefit uh, to map out very large tissue area and five millimeter or even larger should not be a problem. And whether or not you can measure other omics, and I believe uh, probably yes, uh, but that hasn't been demonstrated. And now this is only limited to messenger transcriptomics. And sample compatibility, 
is also very important uh, consideration when you, you choose which technology uh, for, for your specific research. So in this case, ST or VISM uh, still require uh, cryosection of fresh frozen tissue uh, tissues to start with. And you ideally have the cryo uh, micro sectioning, micro dissection tools right next to you uh, before uh, you can uh, go ahead and start your spatial transcriptome uh, experiment. So sample throughput, uh, I don't have firsthand experience, but I imagine it should not be too difficult to process multiple samples per day. Uh, unlike in a uh, uh, sort of sequential fish space, I think one sample sitting on a microscope, you have to image over probably uh, a couple of days to just get a, uh, uh, so one sample image done uh, for uh, hundreds or thousands of protein or gene markers. And so the hands-on time in this case is very much like a typical molecular biology lab. I believe you can finish uh, the entire workflow, excluding the PCR amplification and library preparation uh, within a day. And it is easy to adopt, I believe, uh, but the tricks definitely there. Uh, you have to learn how to use, uh, how to uh, reliably uh, uh, so land your tissue section uh, uh, on a DNA microarray, and, uh, and that does require some practice. And cost-wise, uh, I don't exactly know, but uh, based on some sources, it's around $1,000 per sample prep, uh, excluding the sequencing cost. So now uh, the question along this lines, uh, it is genome-wide sequencing, uh, genome-wide profiling, and but the resolution isn't that great. So the question is whether now we can achieve high spatial resolution NGS based spatial transcriptomics. And so the breakthrough came out last year. Uh, the fundamental principle is still the same. So what you can release the messenger RNA from the frozen tissue section by uh, uh, so light the fixing and the permeabilizing and uh, allowing the RNA to uh, leave the tissue and the capture by the DNA microarray spa. But in this case, the DNA microarray is not a pin model microarray. It's a array of the DNA barcode beads you can pack on the, uh, on the surface of the slide. So in this work, um, uh, Makosko group uh, from the Broad Institute use the about 10 micron DA barcode beads that are synthesized uh, using the chemi chemical, uh, biochemical approach very similar to the dropsic beads synthesis. And then the assemble the beads as a monolayer on the surface of glass slide. And each bead supposedly has only one, has one unique distinct uh, DNA barcode, but you don't know. Okay, now you have to do this in situ indexing to find out the exact sequence on each uh, DNA barcode bead. Okay, once you do that, so your sample is ready to go, and uh, the next steps are very much similar as the ST, the spatial transcriptomics I discussed before, and the, you can put the, the, the tissue. Uh, section on top of the the bead uh, microarray, the bead array, and a slide uh, uh, so permeabilize and a, and a final digest and dissociate the tissue. The messenger is captured on the beads, and then you pull the beads and do reverse transcription and the PCR and the amplification to prepare the sequencing library. What has been demonstrated, okay, in this in this paper, uh, is First of all, okay, the resolution can be significantly improved uh, up to like a 10 micron per pixel or per bit. And the mappable area is still comparable. You can get a two millimeter scale mappable uh, area. And the tissue compatibility, you still have to use the frozen tissue sections to start with. And so what is a little bit tricky, I think for most of the people who have uh, no uh, experience in uh, advanced imaging is uh, you have to go through this in situ indexing or in situ 
uh, sequencing uh, step to decoder beads, uh, this process is very much like a sequential fish, which requires the technically demanding uh, advanced microscopy imaging technique. Uh, in this uh, in this paper, they also look at the brain tissue, and the different uh, different structures can be well identified based on the collection of the of the genes they detected. Uh, although uh, this uh, in this uh, uh, in this work, the total number of transcripts and the total number of genes per spa uh, is fairly low, but by uh, combining the gene signature, you can uh, define the tissues, uh, tissue types and the cell types very well and uh, demonstrate here in the brain tissue and also in other tissue types, for example, liver and the kidney. And about a month ago, very exciting work came out uh, from the same group and in collaboration with, with uh, Fei Chen uh, at the Broad Institute. Uh, they call this slicic v2, slicic version two, and the the major improvement here is uh, the improvement the chemistry <coughs> to allow you to significantly increase the number of transcripts and the number of genes you can detect, uh, showing here. So the number of unique transcripts uh, or UMIs per feature is increased almost one order of magnitude from. Uh, less than 100 across most of the samples to look at in slide six one to uh, between 500 and 1,000 for the slide six version two. So in this case, you can look at uh, the same brain tissue, but uh, a much, uh, much, much greater depth in terms of the genome coverage. And you can also compare uh, specific genes uh, you can detect using three different uh, uh, techniques uh, or four, four different techniques, slicic version one, version two, and a, a single molecule fish and a single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, so slicic two is significantly improved. And the capture efficiency is almost equivalent to single cell RNA sequencing already. Uh, typically that's about like a 10 to 20% of the total transcripts you can uh, you can uh, capture per uh, per cell. Uh, about the same time, I think another technology came out uh, to uh, in, uh, in order to further increase the spatial resolution. Uh, that's called a high definition spatial transcriptomics. And so, in this work, the fundamental biochemistry workflow is still identical, basically. Uh, you create a microarray, uh, the DNA microarray, uh, with the packed of beads, and, and then you have the frozen tissue section uh, placed on top, and a permeabilized and let the messengerized uh, exit, and then captured by the beads. Uh, but the major difference here is they use array of, um, the, the micro wells, okay, microfabricated wells uh, to dock the beads, and the wells are about two micron, a little bit bigger than two micron, the beads are two micron. And in this case, uh, they were able to increase the nominal resolution to two micron, which is really subcellular resolution now. And so uh, in this paper, they demonstrate with the subcellular resolution, uh, you can look at uh, the different, uh, so, if, so although each bead you can capture, the number of transcripts you can capture is fairly low, but you can bin the pixels and uh, identify uh, the signature genes uh, associated with uh, different tissue types and altogether uh, you can still uh, identify uh, different tissue types very well and and the total number, uh, the, 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 so if the number of genes eventually you can detect can be increased uh, to the level of entire transcriptome. So as you can hear, uh, just a one experiment, you can quickly identify a large number of different tissue types at a, a cellular or even subcellular resolution level. Okay, I apologize, I just have to constantly look at my waiting room and add me.
animated people in. All right, just a quick summary about the high resolution, high spatial resolution, spatial transcriptomics technologies. Uh, uh, sp more specifically, okay, SLICIC, uh, because we haven't uh, looked at the HDST sequencing data by ourselves, so we, uh, we download the uh, SLICIC data and did uh, some analysis, uh, so we have reasonably good understanding about the SLICIC data uh, performance. And okay, first of all, in terms of resolution, it's much improved as compared to the ST and the VSIM. So now I can get it down to 10 micron or even two micron nominal resolution. And the cellular resolution, uh, it, it is about the cellular resolution uh, because at a 10 micron level, you can quantify uh, how many cells uh, per pixel, okay, the average number of cells per pixel about 1.5, and the genome-wide coverage it is, and the quality of the sequencing data for SLICIC1 and number of transcripts you can detect is fairly limited, but SLICIC version 2 significantly improved uh, and, uh, by almost uh, one order of magnitude, so you can get about 500 to 1,000 UMIs per per feature per 10 micron pixel size. And the mappable area, uh, I believe, uh, the slicing version two also you can do a, a couple of millimeters, no problem. And whether or not they can do uh, can can look at other omics, uh, not yet demonstrated, uh, but it is possible. Uh, sample compatibility again uh, in the ST and the VSIM and the SLICIC and the HDST, uh, you'll have to uh, start with the frozen tissue section and uh, you are able to permeabilize and uh, let the messenger eyes escape from the tissue such that you can capture on a glass slide uh, on a DNA microarray box. All right, so the sample throughput and so. Uh, so uh, I believe the, uh, the, the workflow, once you have the indexed or decoded beta ray, uh, the sample super should be reasonably good, uh, but you need to do the in situ bit indexing uh, beforehand. Uh, that does require special uh, techniques in advanced microscopy. And the hands-on time, uh, I believe again, if you have the in situ bead indexing down. This is very much like a typical molecular biology workflow. You should be able to finish within a day and even for multiple samples. And how is it easy to adopt? It's very similar as the VSIM and the cost-wise, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, because I really don't know how expensive are um, the, the beads. Okay, so all those methods, I think as I alluded before, uh, although they have slightly different flavors, they use different, uh, they use bees versus spotted DNA microarray, or they use uh, the 10 micron beads versus two micron beads, uh, but the biochemistry fundamental principle are more, uh, is more or less the same, that's called a barcode of solid phase RNA capture for spatial transcriptomics. Uh, if you're interested, you can look up this paper. Um, so, so I think uh, uh, what uh, the question we have uh, in our uh, laboratory is, uh, so whether or not we have to uh, capture, release, and a capture messenger is, can we do something that's very much like a fish? You just uh, uh, deliver the probes and uh, look at the uh, the probe uh, hybridization with the messenger eyes, for example, in situ in the tissue, but you are still able to get a spatial uh, uh, registry. You are still able to get the spatial information on a spatial barcode such that you can reconstruct the spatial transcriptomics uh, or other spatial omics. So this is what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides, largely the technology from our own laboratory. So <laughs> the technology itself now uh, is based on this microfluidics. Uh, this is simple microfluidics. Uh, you don't really need uh, to be an expert in microfluidics, okay? 
uh, this just the PDMS uh, slab. You can direct the place on top of your tissue section. Tissue is right here. You just put your uh, PDMS uh, microfluidics on top. Uh, if you mistakenly uh, so placing the microfluid channels uh, outside your tissue, you can just take it out and replace it. Uh, that doesn't uh, hurt your, doesn't damage your tissue at all. And on the inlets are about the size of uh, so if in the high density micro teeter well play, you can just uh, pat, pat your reagents into those uh, those uh, wells. It doesn't require uh, complicated microfluidics handling. And afterwards, once you load the reagents, you just uh, pull the reagents through those microfluidic uh, channels using the global vacuum and a bank. So that is so anyone. Uh, who, uh, who 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 knows how to basically use the screwdriver and the clamp and the pipette? You should be able to uh, operate uh, this microfluid device. It doesn't really require sophisticated microfluidics technique. So the the basic principle is the following. Okay, uh, as I alluded, we don't want to. Uh, so, so permeabilizing the tissue and the, letting the messenger eyes escape and the capture, we just want to do everything in tissue. And so if we want to uh, just uh, look at a messenger eye, uh, uh, so if the fixed the tissue slide and the tissue section already prepared, for example, already prepared and stored in a freezer uh, for, for weeks, that should be totally fine. And we can just start with that. If you want to look at the proteins, uh, at this step, actually you can add the DNA tag of antibodies called ADT uh, to stand the tissue uh, such that in this case, you can probe not just the messenger, you can also probe the proteins. Uh, so what the microfluidics does is, uh, we first of all, uh, apply the microfluidics to the tissue surface and introduce an array of uh, DNA barcodes. And each DNA barcode has a showing here, um, the oligo, oligo DT, okay, uh, right here, okay, uh, has the oligo DT to capture and the messenger RNA based on the polyethyl, tail, and also it has a unique barcode sequence right here. And so with that, we're able to do uh, the reverse transcription in the tissue during the first flow step. Okay, afterwards, we just take it out and put another PDMS microfluid device on top with all the microfluid channels orthogonal to the direction of the first flow. And then we flow through the barcodes B1, B2 to B50. Uh, and the reason we're able to further expand to even B100. And so now in this case, uh, the, the barcodes uh, contain uh, another set of bar, uh, the, the B reagents B contain another set of barcodes uh, B1 to B50, and, but you can ligate them with the barcode A through the template based on ligation. And so once you finish this two microfluidic flow barcoding, what you end up with the uh, mosaic of tissue pixels. Okay, you remove the PDMS microfluid device, your tissue is still there, okay, uh, totally intact and not damaged at all. And, but you have the barcodes spatially uh, delivered uh, to the surface of tissue forming a mosaic of the barcoded tissue pixels. So now if you want, you can just uh, digest the tissue or retrieve or denature uh, the, the CDA and then you make the uh, library by uh, PCR amplification and, uh, and, and the sequencing. So uh, in our case, we have the sequencing data to detect all uh, messengers uh, across the entire transcriptal and also we demonstrate we can simultaneously detect a panel of proteins, about 22 proteins are raising the data. And as, as I mentioned, the same tissue uh, after the flow barcoding remains intact, actually can image in the tissue, that's exactly the same tissue you image, not the adjacent tissue uh, sample. That's exactly the same tissue you sequenced. So you can get the tissue image and all three sets of data you combine to get a spatial omics, spatial omics, spatial multi-omics data uh, analysis. So this is, this is just a, uh, kind of to show you the difference 
uh, what uh, we end up with this microfluid device is a bunch of tissue mosaics. Uh, each uh, pixel here has a unique DNA barcode. So we're now uh, re uh, so retrieving the messenger RNAs from the tissue and you still have your intact tissue there. You can do whatever image you want to do and after, uh, after you uh, uh, deliver the DNA uh, barcode probes. And so you can image this process uh, by flowing the first set of barcode and you see the, the stripes uh, indicating the hybridization of the first set of barcode and then you, uh, you have the second set of barcode and the, after the, lig uh, the ligation, uh, what you are supposed to see only at the intersections. Okay, so that, that's exactly what we saw. Okay, a mosaic of the tissue pixels and each uh, is located at the intersection of the two flows. And so to verify this flow barcoding on tissue is, um, is well confined spatially. And so in this case, we flow through uh, the, uh, the DNA dye DAPI and the, the uh, uh, cytoskeleton uh, dye phyloidin to look at the cytoskeleton structure. In this case, we look at nuclei. Uh, Sometimes you can see even half of the cell nuclei being stand over here and half of the nuclei. And the uh, cytoskeleton is pretty clear, okay, what's the, uh, the structure is outside the microfluid channel, you don't, you don't see the standing at all. So it confirms uh, the leak-free and the spatially confined uh, delivery of the even small molecules in this case. So here, uh, we, we show the validation of the spatially confined delivery of the, uh, of the barcode A. And so once we use the fluorescent label of barcode A, this basically just a pan messenger eye standing. Uh, you can see almost individual cells here, and there's a 25 micron channel. You see about like a three cells across from this microfluid channels. And any, anywhere outside the channel, you can see half, the half of the cells being standing, the other half of the cells has no pan RNA signal, uh, again, confirming. Uh, the high quality of the spatially defined uh, ray, the barcodes, uh, delivery of the barcodes and the hybridization in situ. And so this is an a 10 micron resolution. So we uh, uh, finish the first and the set, uh, second flow barcoding and the, li and the ligation, and you can see uh, the discrete, uh, the pixels and the square pixels. And it turns out you can also look at the tissues, as I mentioned before, and the tissue remains intact. But interestingly, in this case, the tissue relatively soft. And after we, we, we first flow and the second flow, you can see in the PDMS pressing down the tissue uh, and, and give you this kind of kind of imprinted uh, top, topography on the tissue. So actually you can correlate this topography with your uh, spatial sequencing data and, and, and a further uh, sort of correlate tissue morphology and the spatial transcriptomic data. Uh, so as you hear, for example, this is just a one cell, I believe there's another cell. So at a 10 micron level, we are getting uh, down to a single cell or cellular level. Uh, so we did a quantification so of the number of cells we can see per pixel. And so at a, uh, and a 10 micron uh, and a 10 micron pixel size, uh, we, we found the number of cells per pixel about 1.7, and a and a 50 micron pixel that's a, about 25 cells per pixel. And as we really look at the diffusion distance by by uh, quantifying the fluorescent signal right at the edge of the microfluid channel, we found that diffusion is really negligible. And uh, at a 10 micron resolution with a clamp on, on the PDMS microfluidics, the diffusion distance on the half width of the diffusion distance about like only one micron. So, so potentially we can further decrease the, uh, the pixel size and the further increase the resolution using this deterministic uh, flow barcoding. Uh, so we compare the sequencing data quality 
uh, across different uh, technology platforms. Uh, this is an ST, and this is an SlideSec. This is our uh, uh, DBSec at a 50 micron resolution uh, pixel size, the 10 micron uh, pixel size, and 10 micron pixel size we uh, uh, routinely observe about uh, 22. Uh, 100 genes uh, detected uh, uh, more than 5,000 UMIs per pixel uh, for the mouse embryonic mouse brain tissue. Uh, so here, this is the sort of co-mapping uh, of the whole transcriptome and about 22 proteins uh, will show uh, the number of UMIs, the unique transcripts here, the total number of the protein tags we detected after sequencing uh, we, we can see uh, thousands of those uh, transcripts and thousands of those protein uh, tag rates uh, uh, simultaneously uh, from the same sample. And you can compare this, uh, this exact the same tissue we, we sequenced. You can see the kind of imprinted uh, tissue topography. And this adjacent tissue section, uh, we were able to do HNAE and then we can eventually integrate all the data together. And just to show you at this resolution, uh, what we can see in terms of the tissue uh, morphology and the tissue uh, or cell types uh, in the mouse brain, and we sh show uh, four different proteins in this case, uh, CD63 uh, and the panendothelial antigen and the epicam, which is epithelial marker, and the matcam, we never studied before, but we found this uh, uh, protein is strongly enriching this specific region of the forebrain. And when we look at the panendothelial antigen, this is a beautiful uh, microvascular structure you can uh, you can see from the spatial sequencing data. And the epicam indicates in the early epithelial uh, development, they are highly uh, enriched in the specific regions right here around the neck. I think in the majority of the brain, you don't see much uh, epicam. That makes perfect sense. There are, there are, there are most of the uh, brain cells. Okay, I think I really need to uh, try to wrap up. Um, the, so we did an immunofluorescent scanning uh, to verify, to validate our sequencing data. Uh, so this is our uh, spatial sequencing data. This is immunofluorescent uh, scanning. You can see the specific uh, regions uh, indicating the epicam uh, scanning here and the epicam signal from the sequencing. And you look at the, uh, uh, the line profile, they do match fairly well. Uh, this, this is for the uh, microvasculature, uh, so they also show reasonably good consistency between the two different uh, uh, techniques, the two different uh, methods. Uh, so we further look at the higher resolution in the specific region of the brain, and uh, so this is the entire mouse embryo, but we place our microfluid channel uh, uh, flow barcoding region right here, okay, just uh, in this region, uh, uh, the, the pixels showing here in red are real data. Okay, they are just a pan uh, messenger sequencing data, which is a uh, add up all uh, unique uh, transcripts or UMIs, uh, and it's showing here as in a red color. And so again, based on the tissue topology, the imprint of tissue topology, you can see where exactly we performed the spatial uh, flow barcoding and eventually giving you this spatial uh, pixel uh, tissue uh, tissue map. Uh, so when we look at that, we uh, in the beginning I thought, okay, this is something wrong with the, with with your sample. We saw this over and over. Very likely, this is just a piece of fiber from your king wipe. And but turns out that's not really. We found that gives you beautiful data, and that data uh, corresponds to uh, the pigment cells corresponds to melanocytes. Uh, then we look into some developmental biology at this stage, uh, the mouse uh, embryo E10, we found, uh, wow, actually that's the eye. Okay, this, uh, this eye field, uh, eye, uh, optical vesicle, and around the early stage optical vesicle is a layer, almost a single cell layer of the pigment cells surrounding the eye vesicle.
All right. Uh, so in that case, we were able to see the eye vesicles. Uh, and here, this eye vesicle and this is optical cap. So if, uh, one day after, you can see uh, the image, the, the expression of those specific genes in specific locations. So basically, we're able to look at the spatial temporal dynamics of, of the mouse embryo development. But this is kind of uh, kind of good if we can find out those uh, specific genes or gene markers, but if we don't know, there are any way we can uh, do automated tissue uh, type or tissue feature identification and the computational pipeline develop uh, called a spatial DE allows you to do automated tissue feature identification uh, showing here in the eye. Okay, this is a region of the eye. And uh, again, this is consistent with what we uh, we identify the manually using those marker genes. And in this tissue, actually you can see many other, although the eye is the problem, the most profound uh, uh, tissue feature, you can see in this region, but many other uh, t uh, tissue types are also observed in this uh, region of the, uh, of the tissue as shown here, the, this uh, part of the forebrain, okay, all the way from top to here. And actually, you can see a little bit in the ear. Uh, you can see in the spinal cord and uh, some epithelial development right here. And so, as I mentioned, this technology can uh, does not require okay machine generated release, and it's compatible with the fixed tissue. And that was for modified fixed tissue, but can we further extend it to FLP tissue? This is just a very preliminary data, but so encouraging. This a mouse aorta. Uh, you can you can see uh, the spatial mapping of the very tiny piece of mouse aorta, and this is a total number of UMIs and total number of genes. We're able to detect more than like 1,000 genes uh, from just uh, this FLP sample, which is super encouraging. Uh, so I just want to quickly summarize and uh, with our technology. Uh, again, this is also high spatial resolution. We are able to achieve, um, I think this is, okay, this is the wrong slide. <laughs> we're, we're able to, uh, I think which one is my slide? Yeah, I think this is wrong. Okay, we're able to achieve, uh, this is now low. We're able to achieve the 10 micron uh, feature size comparable to Slicic and a cellular resolution and a, um, uh, the, uh, the, the data quality is gray. Okay, that's different from Slicic and we're able to detect uh, 10,000 UMIs, up to 10,000 UMIs and thousands of genes and the map area is comparable. And what, what is very unique here is since you don't have to permeabilize and release the RNA, you can start with the fixed tissues, even existing fixed tissues, and uh, including F, uh, PFA fixed and FLP fixed tissues. And uh, uh, whether or not they can be very high throughput, and uh, I, I think uh, yes, in particular, if we can fully automate, uh, it doesn't require the imaging process beforehand, uh, unlike uh, the slides that you have to do uh, the bead uh, decoding. And in our case, what you need is a set of reagents. You pipette in there, and uh, absolutely my post constant complaint. Uh, it's, it's a little bit tedious to pipette 50 different barcodes in there. And you can uh, comfortably finish the entire workflow uh, before uh, PCR and the library prep within a day. And uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, although it is a microfluidics, but doesn't require sophisticated microfluidics, it should be easy to adopt. And uh, the cost-wise, since this is developed in my lab, I, I asked my postdoc to calculate, and it's about only $150 uh, to prepare to prepare one sample excluding the sequencing cost. All right, uh, so I, I, I really need to wrap up and uh, um, I have two slides there to show, uh, uh, although we're always excited about the, the genome-wide base by base and a large area spatial tissue omics mapping, uh, which is a powerful tool uh, for discovery, uh, but oftentimes we also need to uh, validate or compare our data to target a messenger RNA or protein mapping uh, in 
uh, in teacher slides. So I just show you two examples. Uh, one is uh, from uh, Professor Gary Nolan, now commercial, commercialized by a, a Koya, I believe uh, Professor Koskan was uh, also involved in this development as well. And this is targeted highland multiplex uh, uh, the protein and the potential also messenger RNA profiling uh, for for targeted uh, tissue mapping, and I, I think another technique to do targeted tissue mapping is the imaging mass cytometry, which is very costly, uh, and you need a uh, you need to synthesize special probes. But it has been commercialized by Fluidime, so it should be accessible in the uh, core facility. And so pretty much that is, uh, I just want to quickly uh, kind of summarize uh, or uh, think about the future of the spatial omics, although we're still at the very beginning of the spatial omics new era, uh, but I'm uh, still thinking we should think about what, what, what will be the next, okay? Uh, so number one, beyond the transcriptomics, can we look at all proteins and how large the panel of proteins we can look at? And so the second is uh, super important. So the spatial omics is unlikely. The only technology you need to address all the questions and you need to uh, uh, seamlessly integrate your data with tissue morphology, histology data, and uh, single cell data sets as well. And uh, 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 beyond uh, transcriptomics and uh, some proteins, uh, can we do epigenomics? Can we look at uh, microarrays, those epitranscriptomics? Can we look at the metabolites and uh, the T cell repertoire, B cell repertoire, and, uh, and so on and so forth? Uh, I really believe the potential is there and the limit is on uh, your imagination. So although we're still just at the uh, beginning of the spatial omics. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm happy to take uh, a couple of questions. Um, so I apologize, I, uh, I'm uh, running over the time. I just have to constantly keep eyes on the waiting room and add many people in there. I'm sure there are a couple of questions in the chat room. <clears throat> okay. Okay, uh, I want to start talking. Okay, how many barcode sequences are present on each of the 10 micron beads or for slicing? How many barcode sequences are, um, Okay, if I understand it correctly, uh, I think your question is about the, the oligo density on the, on the beads, um, which I don't know, uh, but I think uh, for dropsic beads, which is much larger, about 40, 33 to 40 micron, and the, the number of barcodes, uh, uh, the number of oligo probes on the surface of the beads uh, only allow you to capture uh, 10 to 20 percent of the whole transcriptome from single cells. So in this case, uh, I believe the oligo density should be more or less the same as the dropsic beads, but now you have much smaller beads, only 10 micron. Uh, again, that that could be the reason why uh, I think the, the slicic technology, uh, you are now able to, at least in the v V1 version 1, you are now able to capture that many transcripts. Um, I, I don't exactly know. Okay, how many genes and UMIs per bead? Uh, okay, um, yeah, uh, HDST, uh, I haven't uh, so looked into in details, um, but the number of UMIs per B, um, okay, keep in mind that's extremely small bead on a two micron, and the number of UMIs uh, captured per B is uh, a couple, of, okay, like a five or 10. Uh, so it turns out, I think the the group in, at the Brody Institute found you you are better being the beads. Um, for example, uh, five beads across the row and across the column, and then uh, you increase the the feature size or aggregate feature size to five micron to ten micron, you end up with much better data. Um, so yeah, that's what I can. Um, yeah. I think your your uh, your guess was that's one or two UMIs per bead. Um, 
Yeah, I think a couple of that. That's about right. Okay, next question. ACD bio has RNA scope, which is commercially available for multiplex RNA, uh, multiplex RNA fish, and how many multiplex spatial sequencing techniques are commercially applied? Uh, uh, commercially available? Yes. Um, so uh, uh, if you are uh, talking about the NGS based, uh, I think uh, Visum is commercialized uh, as far as I know, that's the only NGS based uh, spatial omics technology uh, commercialized. Um, but uh, if you include the in situ sequencing by imaging, uh, I believe uh, the two, two technologies, one is FISIC and the other in situ uh, FISIC uh, out of the MIT. Uh, has been commercialized by a startup company. I've got a name, uh, but I can look up it and, uh, and give you. And the in situ sequencing being com commercialized by a co startup company called a Car uh, um, you know, Car Cartana, uh, based in uh, Sweden. Uh, yeah, those are the two uh, in situ sequencing technologies already in a commercialization pipeline. Okay, for those RNAs. Who do not have poly ATL or micro uh, uh, So that's a great question. So that's kind of my very last slide. So uh, whether or not other RNAs, uh, in particular micro I, I'm very interested in. Um, uh, so current methods are not able to do in the, um, but in our case, I think a D basic determination of broccoli in situ. Uh, what, what what do you need to have? Just a, a set of reagent. You design your probes and you flow through the barcodes. So you you can design your probes. Uh, for example, with the uh, with the um, sort of ligation and uh, ligation and enzyme, and uh, you can ligate all small RNAs. Uh, that is possible. Um, yeah, you just uh, need to be creative in the design of your uh, probes. Uh, Okay, I think uh, Alec helped me uh, to answer that question. I think uh, our average is seven UMIs per B uh, on HDST. Okay, for... okay, spatial distance between the pixels for DB uh, IT for D basic. Uh, so now we are using. Um, I think the same feature, the same uh, pixel size and the same spacing. So if that's 10 micron, it's 10 micron in between. Um, but now with our recent data, we, we believe we can uh, reduce the uh, spacing uh, to, for example, five micron, that should be durable. Um, but I think the interesting uh, finding uh, from our own data and also from uh, I think a uh, sort of computational aggregation in a uh, slice uh, it uh, it seems like uh, uh, if you are at a like a 50 micron above uh, your ability to resolve the sort of cellular level information is dramatically reduced uh, but 20 micron 10 micron somehow more or less the same or 20 or even smaller um, but I would say that depends on the tissue types um, yeah, but in the brain tissue and the mouse uh, embryonic, uh, embryonic tissues, I think uh, it, it seems like a 20 micron is a, uh, is a cutoff. Okay, the FISIC company is called a Red, Red Cool. Yes, thanks. Um, okay, the micron, I could be able to screen pre and post process. Um, okay, okay, Armanda asked a question about micron. I, uh, I don't exactly know, uh, but. But I, I think the versatility of the deep ethic is uh, you just need to be creative in your rage and in your probe design. And uh, eventually you just uh, do the same cross flow barcode, you get a spatial information. So, all right. Uh, so, for the interest of time, if no more questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fan. This was a great talk. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ame. And uh, next week we have Professor Steve Wah from Yale uh, to talk about the 
uh, sort of spatial uh, nuclear chromosome structure uh, mapping uh, in tissue. So I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Thank you. Take care. Take care.